we're all excited. We usually do bowling. Today we're doing karaoke. Are you going to sing? Listen to your I, voice I right now. I, I want to hear I that. I can't sing normally, much less today. And that's but, why Brian Kilmeade yes, has to leave he had town to go. because he hates karaoke. And today in his place, we've got <laughs> like a Pyro. stray dog out from the cold. And it's real cold out here. My doggy foster parents are here to take care of you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Ainsley. We're glad is, to have you on that, the curvy couch. Alabama spoke yesterday. Oh, yeah, they, they did. sure did. And that is our Fox News alert and our lead this morning. An upset in Alabama for the Republicans. Democrat Doug Jones pulling off a win against Republican Roy Moore in that special election to fill the Senate seat left vacant by now Attorney General Jeff Sessions. But Moore says it is not over. Jonathan Siri is live in Montgomery, Alabama with the latest for us. Jonathan. Good morning, Ainsley, Steve, and Todd. Ordinarily, the Republican candidate would be a shoe-in in the solidly red state of Alabama, but allegations of sexual impropriety against Republican Roy Moore completely changed the dynamics of this race. And you have Doug Jones, the Democrat, becoming the first member of his party to be elected to the U.S. Senate from Alabama in 25 years. This campaign has been about common courtesy and decency and making sure everyone in this state, regardless of which zip code you live in, is going to get a fair shake in life. But Roy Moore, who rode to the polls on horseback, has yet to concede the race. His campaign, hoping Moore's vote count would come within half a percentage point of Jones, which would trigger a recount. I really want to thank you for coming tonight and realize when the vote is this close that it's not over. And we've still got to go by the rules about this recount provision. But with Jones coming in with 49.9% of the vote to Moore's 48.4, which is a four and a half point, which is a one and a half point difference, a recount appears unlikely. President Trump weighed in on Twitter saying, congratulations to Doug Jones on a hard fought victory. The right in votes played a very big factor, but a win is a win. The people of Alabama are great and the Republicans will have another shot at this seat in a very short period of time. It never ends. And the president may have a point when it comes to those write-in votes. Alabama voters cast nearly 23,000 write-in votes, which was larger than the margin of victory. And in advance of this election, many Republicans were saying, I can't vote for a Democrat, but I'm going to write in a conservative other than Roy Moore. Back to you guys. All right, Jonathan Seri, thank you very much. Keep in mind, a lot of people down in Alabama wrote in the name of Luther Strange. Luther Strange is the guy who currently is holding the seat uh, temporarily until a new senator is seated. Donald Trump supported Luther Strange in the beginning, said Roy Moore could not win. But here's the thing. Donald Trump uh, and Steve Bannon essentially were at loggerheads over this particular seat because mm -hmm. Steve Bannon wants to drain the swamp. He feels Mitch McConnell is a swamp and Mitch McConnell supported Luther Strange. So in turn, he was going to support the other guy. Judge Roy Moore. Well, then Jones caught a break when all these allegations came out against Judge Moore. The environment was, was really bad. The story, I felt like, was very, it was just horrific. Right. It was hard yeah. for women especially to go to the polls and vote for him, even though those, those allegations were just allegations. And even though it happened so long ago, this was not a referendum on Trump. I feel like it was a referendum on Harvey Weinstein. Right. Weinstein. And look, I don't want to be Pollyanna Pyro here, but let's not forget there are still 51 mm -hmm. GOPs, 49 Dems starting in, in January. And also, here's a few other takeaways. Unless Doug Jones wants to go completely scorched earth with liberal policies, he's a Democrat in Alabama, which is called a Republican in the rest mm -hmm. of the world. And let's not forget, he is going to have to answer to his constituents, a majority of which voted for him, who are Republicans. So let's go sure. look at some key issues here. Immigration. Do you think Alabama people want open borders? B, do you think uh, in terms of welfare reform, right. which is one of Donald Trump's big ticket items for 2018, do you think Alabamans don't want welfare reform? Well, Todd, you, you've I'm just... I'm Pollyanna Pyro here. The, the political reality is, though, he's going to vote exactly as Chuck Schumer tells him to. Is you think so? True. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't 
don't you I'm think that puts so them in a bad position, though, <laughs> in 2020 when no. Sessions is back after no. a stint as AG? All right. Well, that's what they were saying about Claire McCaskill, about all sorts of Republican or Democrats who are currently in uh, states that uh, Donald Trump won. Anyway, we're going to be talking about that uh, all throughout the morning. Doug Jones, the big winner in Alabama. Yeah. Meanwhile, let's switch to is there a bias at the FBI and particularly at the Mueller investigation? It sure looks like it. Remember, we told you about Peter Strzok, this guy who had a girlfriend who was a, one of the attorneys on the Mueller case. They sent 10,000 anti-Trump uh, emails, text messages back and forth. And Fox News yesterday obtained 375 of them. Turns out they hate Trump. Oh, they hate him. They worked at the FBI. They worked on this investigation. Here are some of those text messages. This is from Lisa Page, the win. Ten, uh, 100 million to zero. Right. That was the day after the Republican debate here on Fox. Uh, here's another one from August the 6th. And I tell you what we'll do, Ainsley. You play Paige and I'll play Strzok. All okay? Right. Okay. And maybe you're meant to stay where you are because you're meant to protect the country from that menace. Thanks. It's absolutely true that we're both very fortunate. And of course, I'll try and approach it just that way. I just know it will be tough at times. I can protect our country at many levels. Not sure if they're if that is helps. so shady. OK, I understand they're allowed to have their political opinions. They're dating, whatever. They're sending their opinions back and forth. But when she says, I'm so glad you're a part of this investigation because it's your job to save our country. Yeah. And he says, yes, I'm so fortunate that I'm a part of this investigation. That's how I'm reading it. And take a look at this passage. This was the day of the final debate. He says, I am riled up. Trump is an effing idiot, is unable to provide a coherent answer. There you go. You guys got to play actors today. <laughs> I'm just going to cue it up to Jay mm. Sekulow. Here's what he has to say with regard to the underlying issue of if these individuals are in the Bob Mueller team, should Bob Mueller be leading that team or should we have a special counsel to investigate Bob Mueller? Take a listen. At the end of the day, you have to say, how is this allowed to continue? Why is this not, why are these people not terminated? And you know what the answer to that is? It's, and people don't like when you say it, but it is the deep state. It's the bureaucrats. All right, there have been a number of individuals on our air who say, look, I'm not at that point yet. A number of major Republicans who say, Bob Mueller really is a Boy Scout, and you know we still need to give him the benefit of the doubt, allow him to do this investigation. But at the end of the day, as somebody who went to law school, and whose law school is basically 20% on one side, 20% on the other side, 60% people who just love the game of law, you can't tell me that Bob Mueller can't find somebody in that 60% who says, I am willing to join this investigation, be nonpartisan, and do the best job I can right. for my country to uncover the truth. Well, and well, keep in mind, those text messages, apparently, I'm being told, were before the investigation. Began, that's exactly before right. Before the Mueller investigation. Surely. But those and, are his opinions. And uh, both of them are off the case. Uh, he wasn't fired from the FBI. He was put in HR, and she was removed from the case as one of the uh, Mueller attorneys and has returned to investigating things at the FBI. But I tell you what, it's not just, the, uh, it's not just that case where uh, it looks like there's a Trump bias. Look at the media bias of President Trump. In the last three months, the Media Research Center did a survey and found that 90 percent of the coverage on ABC, NBC, and CBS on their evening news was anti-Trump. Look at the month of September. 359 negative stories to 31 positive ones. October, 435 to 41 positives. And then November, 320 negative stories and only 33 positive stories. And these are statements from reporters and nonpartisan sources. We say this all the time on this couch. You don't have to like the individual at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. But at the end of the day, as a journalist, you have to be objective when he has done something right. And you can't say that the stock market, which is above 24,000, a number nobody has really ever mm -hmm. seen before, nobody has ever seen before, period. You got to give the man credit just for that. Make it, equal. make it equal. Exactly. Even if you have people on that give their opinions, just try to make it fair and balanced. And right, but biased. it's the nightly news. There shouldn't be any opinion. True, it should true. be just, here's what happened today. But that happened Those a days are ago. long gone, Steve. Yeah, that, uh, those are the days of Walter Cronkite. Right. That's the way it was. Oh, well. Uh, 6 to 11 now here in New York City, and Jillian joins us here in Studio F. Good, Good morning. morning. I'll give you guys some news right now. I'll give you some headlines of the morning. Good morning to you at home. North Korea vowing to beef up their nuclear arsenal as nations around the world warn them it's time to stop. 
Dictator Kim Jong-un telling scientists he wants to increase the quality and number of deadly weapons. But Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says now is the time for diplomacy. We're ready to talk anytime North Korea would like to talk. And we're ready to have the first meeting without precondition. It's not realistic to say we're only going to talk if you come to the table ready to give up your program. They have too much invested in it. Last month, North Korea launched its most advanced missile yet, potentially capable of striking anywhere in the U.S. President Trump signing a $700 billion defense policy bill to support our nation's heroes. With the signing of this defense bill, we accelerate the process of fully restoring America's military might. We need our military. It's got to be perfecto. The bill includes money for core Pentagon operations, as well as funding for overseas missions and missile defense, and new equipment and pay raises for troops. But there's a catch. Congress must now roll back a 2011 law that restricts defense spending at $549 billion. President Trump making good on another key campaign promise. We have some bad hombres here, and we're going to get them out. ICE arresting more than 100 illegal criminals in New Jersey wanted for deportation violations. And as one state cooperates, Attorney General Jeff Sessions is again blasting the city of Baltimore for its sanctuary policy. Baltimore is one of dozens of jurisdictions in the U.S. that prevent local police from working with ICE. That's a look at your headlines. I will send it back to you guys. You're right. A lot going on. Yep. Thanks, Jillian. Thanks, Jillian. Well, first he wore socks depicting officers as pigs, and now Colin Kaepernick is sparking a new wave of outrage from police. And this time officers say he's putting their lives in danger. And with the allegations of bias on Robert Mueller's investigative team, the president's attorneys say it's time for another special counsel. But our next guest from the Wall Street Journal says let Mueller keep digging. He will explain coming up. President Trump's attorneys calling for another special counselor to investigate the investigators involved in the Mueller probe. As we learn, many of them, but it, as we have learned about many of them, but in a new op-ed titled Let Mueller Keep Digging, our next guest writes, if the president fires Mr. Mueller now, it will look as though he has something to hide. If another special counsel is appointed, it will further diminish the proper investigative authority here. Joining us right now is Main Street columnist for the Wall Street Journal and a former speechwriter for George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Man, he's got a long business card. <laughs> Bill McGurn joins us live. Good morning to you. Good morning. You look at our uh, lead story in politics where 375 of those text messages text, between right. the FBI investigator and the FBI lawyer, they hate Trump. That kind of makes the case somebody should be investigating the investigators. Right. Well, look, they, um, uh, even Mr. Mueller recognized that because he took the guy off the case. I mean, right. the question is, was uh, the agent... Uh, who, having, you know, he was having an affair with the uh, with the FBI lawyer who was right. also on the case. I mean, there are conflicts of interest all over the place. So um, I would like things investigated, but the proper authority for investigating the government is the United States Congress, the elected representatives of the American people. Well, uh, the FBI director. Christopher Ray went in front of the Congress last week and essentially said, you know, I'd love to tell you, but I can't because we've got this investigation yeah, going it, on. It's, it's an incredible assertion um, for this. Look, I, I start with the mantra that um, special prosecutors corrupt and independent prosecutors corrupt. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm against a special prosecutor to begin with. And that's why I think the answer for these people... If, if President Trump fires Mr. Mueller now, it'll right. look like he has something to hide. Right. I think Mr. Mueller's team is doing a lot to discredit itself, so I'd let that go. Second, uh, for some people in Congress, along with Mr. Trump's lawyer, calling for a special investigator, basically for the special prosecutor. Right. I, I think if the problem is someone doing something um, in an unaccountable way in the darkness, uh, that the answer is to throw another one on top of the heap. I right. think that's incredible. Congress, ha first of all, President Trump could declassify a lot of this information. The president is the ultimate declassifier. The right. declassifier. So what would you regime. like him to declassify? I'd like to declassify to start with um, what the FBI knows about the Steele dossier, and particularly, right. was it used 
by the FBI to gain FISA warrants to listen in on members of Trump's team. We don't need all the details, but just did the FBI sure. use it? And then if they did use it, did they have any doubts about the veracity of the information? Because the FBI director last week said, I can't divulge what was in that FISA warrant. And then, uh, you know, which is nonsense. He can say whether what the Trey dossier Gowdy was used and, and the president's team should be out there trying to make as much of this public as possible. Presumably, Mr. Trump has an interest in transparency if he's telling the truth that there was no collusion and no obstruction. So let Robert Mueller do his job. Have the president declassify that FISA stuff. And if Congress isn't going to get answers, cut off the funding to the FBI. Yeah, Congress can do a lot. It has the power of the purse, has the power to impeach, and it has the power to hold people in contempt and, in fact, jail them until they testify. I think Congress blew it on Lois Lerner, and they're paying the price for that now, that no one takes them seriously. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I read all about it in the uh, Wall Street Journal. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Straight ahead, after that botched subway bombing here in New York City is a drone attack. Next, our next guest used drones to hunt terrorists and has a scary warning. 24 minutes after the hour now on a Wednesday morning. Thank you so much for being here. Some quick headlines now. A team from the NTSB on the way to Iowa to investigate a deadly school bus fire. Two people, the 74-year-old driver and a 16-year-old girl killed after the bus backed out of a driveway, fell into a ditch, and burst into flames near Des Moines. The cause still unknown. And we now know it was an illegal campfire that sparked one of these six wildfires raging across Southern California. The Los Angeles Fire Department says it caused the Skirball fire, torching man mansions in Bel Air, but so far, no arrests. Ainsley and Steve. Wow, both of those stories are pretty horrific. Yeah, thank you, Todd. All right, it is a popular tech toy. Many kids want it for Christmas and a potentially deadly assault weapon, actually. After the explosion here in New York City in the subway, experts worry a drone attack could be next. Yesterday, we spoke to former Boston uh, Police Commissioner Ed Davis about the threat, and he said this about drones. As the technology becomes more reliable and the payload becomes larger for these devices, which you can buy easily on the internet, um, the the problem is that we have nothing in our arsenal uh, to stop them from uh, from coming in. So uh, it's it's really a problem. Here to discuss, we've got former Special Operations Intel analyst and author of Drone Warrior, an elite soldier's inside account of the hunt for America's most dangerous enemies, Brett Velikovich. Brett, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. You know, when we had this uh, terror strike a couple of days ago here in New York, this guy uh, took the homemade pipe bomb, strapped it to himself, and went into that uh, tunnel over by the Port Authority and detonated it. Uh, But... And so ultimately, he's in the hospital because he almost, you know, got burned up pretty bad. But ultimately, for a terrorist who wants to inflict damage on New York City, they could put a couple of grenades on a drone and they wouldn't even get hurt. So what's to stop them? Well, you're absolutely right. And the fact is that areas like New York City are particularly vulnerable because there's high concentration of people and that Mm -hmm. it allows for a greater blast uh, radius. And the fact is that ISIS has proven that this is an effective tool on the battlefield. It's been nearly two years since we saw the first commercial use of a drone um, in Iraq where ISIS fighters took explosives, strapped them to a drone and dropped them over coalition forces. Mm -hmm. And terrorist groups are, are looking for tools like this to conduct attacks domestically and so with the availability of, of cheap consumer drones um, really it's it's just a matter it's not a matter of uh, if this will happen but when Brett, that is so scary if that happened here in the US do we have any mechanisms set up through our government to stop a drone we do, but the, the, the fact is that, uh, you know, the U.S. government hasn't, has yet to really embrace uh, this technology. There are a number of different uh, devices that are being built that can actually counter uh, this drone right. threat. Even the manufacturers themselves uh, know uh, that this is something that they need to fix. So there are systems out there that uh, groups like the Port Authority and NYPD should be using and putting these, these devices in their command center that have the ability to detect uh, drones within a, a five to ten mile radius, have the ability to determine uh, 
uh, the trajectory of them, where right. the pilot is that's actually operating them. And then there's also a number of systems, some that uh, we, we've shown on your program mm -hmm. before, that have the ability to jam the signal right. of those drones and actually stop them from conducting a mass casualty attack. I know here in the New York City area, the Port Authority is so concerned about drones, uh, they stopped selling them near the airport so that because there was a problem out at JFK. But uh, Brett, tell us a little bit about geofence. What is geofence? Could that help? Sure. So geofencing is a technology that's used to essentially act as a virtual fence or a virtual perimeter where the drone is unable to actually fly into a particular area. Some of the manufacturers that uh, have developed drones, drones will actually put geofencing into the software so that a drone is unable to fly in, in a particular area. That the thing great. about New York City, you know, it's it's a great it's great when it's used, and you know there are methods you know potentially to hack that, and that's why you do need a layered uh, counter drone approach if you're going to do take on this strategy, but in New York City in particular, um, it's a no-fly zone, but the geofence around that city is not like it is in Washington, D.C. If you try to fly, say, a DJI drone, some of the drones you're showing right there on the screen, yeah. into Washington, D.C., it would actually be blocked from flying over that, those locations. That doesn't exist in New York City. That mm. only really exists around the airports. And so you have the ability to fly around a particular, uh, you know, spots yeah. and, and conduct uh, these okay. attacks. And that's, that's a dangerous thing. So geofencing is definitely something that needs to be more prolific and used to, to, to counter this threat. Mm, maybe it will be. This is something new. So yeah. thank you so much, Brett. Yeah, nice to see you. All right. Uh, straight ahead on this Wednesday, he kicked off the national anthem protests across the NFL. He wore socks depicting officers as pigs. Well, now Colin Kaepernick is sparking a new wave of outrage. This time, cops say he just put their lives in danger. I talked to some members of the National Guard, which today is celebrating 381 That's years awesome. in existence. Wonderful. Some of them were there at the subway bombing, kept our country safe, our city safe. Right. So we're so grateful for what our men and women who serve our country right. do for us. Because here in uh, New York City, a number of National Guardsmen are posted permanently right. to Port places Authority. like the Port Authority. My daughter, uh, who takes the bus in from New Jersey every day, sees them. Always says thank you. Thank you she for your does. service. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. They do so many things besides what you think they do. They're, they've got their hands in so many yeah. things that yeah. make our country better. And if you're not familiar with what they do, we're going to talk to them and find yes. out what their duties are and how they protect you and your family. In the meantime, there are about 50 of them here, but we've <laughs> got to all be quiet for a second because uh, Jillian's going to join us right now with the news. That's right. Just a couple seconds here. That's Let's all. get you caught up uh, this morning. Starting with this, prison guards outraged over Colin Kaepernick's surprise visit to inmates at Rikers Island. The former 49ers quarterback, known for kneeling during the national anthem, speaking out about police brutality and social injustice in New York City. The president of the Corrections Officers Union slamming the visit, telling the Daily News, quote, this will only encourage inmates to continue to attack correction officers at a time when we need more protection. The Ten Commandments will soon stand outside the Arkansas State Capitol once again. A commission clearing the way for the monument after a man plowed through and destroyed the original original marker less than 24 hours after it was put up in June. Um. Jeez, the new monument will include four concrete posts for protection. It will be installed in the coming weeks. From the big screen to the Oval Office, The Rock once again fueling the rumors about a 2020 run. The pro wrestler turned movie star telling Ellen about his possible career change. This isn't the first time he's hinted about getting on the it has a really nice ring to it. We'll keep you posted. Great. Uh, Janice Dean is outside. And Janice, this is uh, your upstairs. Uh, yes, because it's cold outside. <laughs> exactly. And right. we brought the National Guard here inside as well because that's how cold it is. Uh, and we're going to say happy birthday to them in just a moment. But look at the wind chill. Right now, it is about 10 degrees, what it feels like with the winds in New York City. So that's why we're inside. 13 in New York later on. But watch this. So this is the forecast wind chill as we go through the next 12 to 24 hours. We just have shot after shot of cold air moving in. So so this is Friday at 4 a.m., still in the teens in New York City. So you can see we've got that cold air pouring in and the chance for snow tonight and also as we get into the weekend because the cold air is in place. We have these clipper systems moving across the Midwest and the Great Lakes. And overnight tonight, if you're up around, say, 2 a.m., we might actually get a little bit of snow in New York City. It's a quick mover, but we'll blast some snow in here. Then it will be out of the way. And then, of course, the temperatures are going to be remaining cold through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. A little bit of a warm-up as we get into Monday. 
Sunday for the Northeast. Here's your forecast today. Snow across the Great Lakes, the Midwest downwind of those Great Lakes. We could get several inches of snow. Northern Rockies look at get snow here. Central Plains look good today. Really nice today. Still breezy across Southern California. Uh, the fire threat remains elevated over the next couple of days into the weekend. All right, Steve Ainsley and Brian, big birthday today. That's right. That's right. That's it. Janice, today is the U.S. National Guard's birthday. They turned 381 years old. They look good for 381. Really <laughs> and today we're honoring them on this special holiday. Joining us now, General Joseph Langell, along with Command Sergeant Major Chris Kepner and many members of the National Guard. First of all, congratulations on your big birthday. Thank Next, you. I have to ask, why don't you tell us all the things that you do as National Guard members? I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> you probably don't have enough time here, but, uh, for, well, firstly, we're deployed all over the world as part of the Army and the Air Force, keeping America safe. We were just over there for Thanksgiving, serving Turkey to troops in Afghanistan and Iraq and Kuwait and, and uh, all over the Middle East. And, and so we do the warfight mission as part of our Army and Air Force uh, every single day. Um, and additionally, as, uh, as many of you know, is, is, is we take care of response and we're the governors and state response force to work with the first responders and the and the uh, emergency uh, responders when hurricanes happen and what and about these fires out the in fires California? Out, and last Friday I was with California. We we have uh, almost 2,000 California National Guard members out there working with emergency responders and Cal fires and the responders uh, that are saving people's lives, helping evacuations, saving people's uh, homes. Uh, I flew in a in a in a C-130 that dropped fire retardant on the fires itself. Uh, unique skill sets practiced by the National Guard and it's, it's extremely yeah. well integrated. Yeah. Sergeant Major. Why did you enlist, and what does it mean to you to be a part, to serve our country? Uh, Ma'am, I, I tell you, it's a great honor to serve our country. And uh, really, I enlisted because uh, uh, I thought that uh, service was uh, something that I wanted to dedicate my life to. And now at this level, I get to uh, help shape other soldiers and airmen uh, in their service as well. That's terrific. Tell us about Empire Shield. So, sir, Empire Shield is a, a mission that our uh, New York National Guardsmen do to um, assist local authorities here in New York City. And uh, with Those security. are the guys and gals who were uh, posted at the Port Authority a couple of days ago and leapt into action as soon as the bomb went off, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, they did. And they were there right at the uh, point of point of attack, if yeah. you will, uh, to assist local law enforcement. They've been on duty since 9-11, and yeah. uh, there's about 800 of them here. Colonel Pete Riley here, the commander of Task Force Empire Shield. You've seen them at Port Thank Authority, you. Grand Central Station, uh, or airports and stuff, and uh, and they were right there embedded right when the bomb went off just the other day. Colonel, take this microphone and tell us a little bit about the men and women who... Yes, I'm very working. proud of all the uh, men and women of Joint Task Force Empire Shield. They responded right away when the attack uh, happened. Within about a minute, I had five soldiers uh, with their weapons drawn. Uh, along with Port Authority Police and uh, NYPD, and they were able to um, secure the area. And then when they, uh, when they evacuated the bus terminal, they did very, very well. We're at all the uh, bridges and tunnels uh, here in New York City. Airports. <laughs> we're at the airports. I see so if you ever go week. through uh, JFK Airport, yeah. Yeah. you're going to see Joint Task Force Empire Shield. You go through uh, LaGuardia, yeah. you're going to see them. If you go through uh, Grand Central, always uh, very proud of them, keeping us safe. Right. Serving their good. country, their state. It's fantastic. And they're all fellow you New Yorkers. We see it all the time. 50,000 men and women in our National Guard nationwide, right? Big part, of our, big part of our Department of Defense, about 350,000 Army and, and 105,000 Airmen. Um, big part of our Army and Air Force, and we're proud of it. Well, God bless you all. Thank Do you I all. Can I say hi to somebody right here? Yes, of What's course. What's your name? Uh, it's Major Justin Wolfman. And what made you get into the National Guard? Let's get out of the uh, Essentially, I joined up in uh, shortly after September 11th. I lived here in New York City uh, since 1999, and it's been a fantastic opportunity. And uh, thank everybody here, and obviously... Uh, Thank you for having us. Okay. Aww, Saved 500 you. people in Hurricane Harvey. Oh, this unit God right bless here. bless you guys. Thank yeah. you for what you do today right. and every day. Well, happy anniversary, National Guard 381. Uh, ladies yeah, and gentlemen, everyone. thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh, so great. All right. Uh, meanwhile, we were just talking about the Port Authority and how you guys have been guarding out there. A new report suggests the Port Authority attack shows the ISIS threat is evolving, not eliminated. So how does the president's terror strategy get rid of them once and for all? That is coming up. All right. Some quick headlines for you. First up, a wanted thief in a Santa hat. Watch right there. Caught on camera terrorizing 
Holmes in the Hollywood Hills. You can see the Grinch breaking through a back window, helping himself to jewelry and anything else he can get his mitts on. Police say he's hit at least two houses in the lavish area so far this year. And the Festival of Lights has begun. Hanukkah officially kicking off, celebrating the rededication of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. President Trump tweeting, wishing all of those celebrating Hanukkah around the world a happy and healthy eight nights in the company of those they love. Hundreds gathering for the National Menorah Lighting right there, just across the street from the White House. All right, Angel. Okay, thank you, Steve. Now to a Fox News alert. The 27-year-old Bangladesh man accused of setting off a pipe bomb in New York City on Monday is now facing both federal and state terrorism-related charges. This, as a Washington Examiner article claims, the attack actually shows that the ISIS threat is evolving and is not eliminated. So... How does the president's terror strategy get rid of the caliphate once and for all? Joining me now to weigh in on this is Fox News foreign policy analyst Kyron Skinner. Kyron, thank you for being with us. Thank you. You're welcome. How do you answer that question? How do we get rid of the caliphate once and for all? Um, we, we hope that um, that issue is addressed in the upcoming national security strategy, which I believe the National Security Council is issuing on Monday. I would suggest um, the following. Um, we have to understand that although ISIS has been largely but not completely defeated in Iraq and Syria, I believe there are a couple thousand ISIS fighters still um, um, in those two countries, um, that the um, ISIS organization is moving to other areas. It's in Libya, in the Sinai Peninsula, it's in Afghanistan, even the Philippines regrouping. Um, and it is moving away from a kind of command and control center with a big Islamic army to um, inspiring sleeper cells and lone wolves. Um, and that the attack on the West will be much greater, perhaps, than it's been now that it doesn't have the land mass it had um, many months ago in this year. Um, so understanding that the threat is evolving is the first step. And that although it has suffered great military blows and perhaps some ideological blows because some of the potential true believers now doubt the organization um, since the caliphate does not exist, um, but there are others who are inspired by it. And we've got to include in our national security strategy a way of identifying lone wolves and developing a counter narrative um, that makes the ideology unattractive um, to people who are in crisis themselves. Mm, what about the chain migration? Yesterday the president was saying we're going to end it. president wants to break that chain of chain migration and the diversity visas. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's a complicated issue. I'm a, an academic. I'm a professor at, at um, Carnegie Mellon and a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And, um, you know, foreign students are so important in faculty um, to who we are and our great educational system. But at the same time, I do think we need better vetting processes for those coming from countries that um, have, you know, deep ties to extremism. And that does not mean that the United States closes its borders, but that we more sharply and smartly try to defend ourselves and think critically about who we let into yeah. the country. The president has said that, let them in on a merit-based system, a point system, and I, I think some of those students that you talk about would definitely be let in. Thank you so much, Kyron, for being with us. Great to see you. Thank you. You're welcome. This illegal immigrant was deported three times, and now he's charged with murder. How does this keep happening? 